Well, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Igor Sherikov, as I said. I'm a Zero uh, Consortium Director and Senior Researcher at the Center for Studies in Higher Education at UC Berkeley. And I'd like to welcome you all at our center's discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on international higher education. So uh, today we have speakers and participants from across the globe. And I appreciate spending your morning coffee, afternoon tea, or evening cocktail with us. Um, so here's our plan for today. First, each panelist will speak for about five to eight minutes. After that, I will ask questions from the audience and you submitted so many great and insightful questions at registration. So our panelists generously agreed to uh, stick around for an hour and a half to answer them. We'll try to cover all of them. And I also encourage you to ask questions in the chat window next to this video. We will cover them as well. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please log in using your Gmail or Berkeley address. And if you have to run for another meeting or miss anything, uh, don't worry, the recording will be posted on our website and YouTube channel. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic brought a lot of uncertainty into higher education. And one of the biggest unknowns is the future of internationalization and student mobility. California is one of the biggest hubs for international students in the US. And at, U at the University of California system, around one fourth of tuition income comes from international students. Will the students return to campuses or join remotely if tram restrictions continue? Will international students and their families be able to afford education abroad? What is the role of technology in the future of international education? Today, we have four highly experienced and well-known figures in the field of international higher education and uh, to answer these questions. They represent a unique mix of perspectives from academic research, university administration, private and nonprofit sectors. Let me introduce our speakers. Uh, Margaret Heisel, a senior associate at the Center for Studies in Higher Education at UC Berkeley. Uh, Margaret served uh, in a variety of academic and leadership roles within the University of California system, Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, and NAFSA. She also was the mastermind behind, behind this panel discussion. Uh, Tim O'Brien, Senior Vice President with Intel University Partnerships, a private sector organization supporting the global recruitment and interna internationalization efforts. Team has almost 30 years experience in international education and also held senior leadership roles uh, in UK universities. Um, Rajika Bandari, president and CEO of the IC3 Institute, um, a part of international career and college counseling movement. Rajika previously spent over a decade at the Institute of International Education where she led thought leadership initiatives and its global research and impact studies. And finally, Hans David, uh, Director of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. Hans is a globally renowned scholar whose primary field is internationalization in higher education. And I can say there is a rare paper on international higher ed that doesn't cite his work. Um, so Margaret, um, I, I would like you to start this discussion. Yes, uh, thank you, Igor, very much. I'd uh, like to simply provide you re really quickly some background for this discussion. Our title, which is uh, the end or the revival of international higher education, because I do believe we're facing a big choice here. This, this discussion is prompted, of course, by the effect of COVID-19 on university internationalization. We don't know what all the consequences of this virus are going to be for higher education generally, but we do know it's going to be, it is having a serious impact. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Classroom instruction has all been moved online and, and campus budgets have been very negatively impacted. As Igor mentioned, we, have a, we had a panel on this last Monday and that, uh, that panel is available, that session is available on our website. But the third big area being impacted is internationalization. 
And it's interesting because this comes after 20 years of very solid and steady growth in internationalization on university campuses. It's been characterized by student and faculty mobility, by research collaboration across board, national borders, and by many partnerships among universities in different countries. But now, with limits on mobility, and furthermore, the depiction in the US of the virus as a foreign invader, I think all of these areas are going to feel effects. But university internationalization is really critical to the mission of universities. The advancement of knowledge has always thrived on the sharing of discoveries and on research collaboration across national borders. And furthermore, our domestic students greatly benefit from study abroad and from having international students enroll on their campuses because with those intercultural experiences, they are much better prepared for good employment in a globalized economy. And they, have, they are prepared for greater civic engagement and they have a much better understanding, frankly, of their own culture, of US culture. Certainly another final benefit that I would emphasize of internationalization has been the enrollment of international students and the tuition that they have paid. Just at UC Berkeley, international students this past year paid roughly $272 million just in tuition, never mind accommodations and all the other uh, investments they have made. Which this $272 million has been a major assist to the Berkeley campus, whose budget has still not recovered to the level of state support that existed prior to the 2008 recession. Now, if we look at international student enrollment overall for the past 20 years, as Igor was suggesting, it's grown very steadily and frankly, very rapidly. But in the next few years, uh, well, also just in the last few years, th those numbers have begun to drop. Uh, there have been decreases in international student enrollment, both at the undergraduate and at the graduate level. There's greater competition around the world from universities for enrollment of those students and rising at nationalism has also had a real impact. UC Berkeley hasn't felt that loss because of its high international standing, but other uni universities across the country, across the US certainly have. Now, if we look to this fall and the immediate term after that, both with the effects of the pandemic, greater enrollment decreases are very likely but despite the challenges today of the pandemic and of rising nationalism, this disruption presents us with a, a real opportunity, an opportunity for change and improvement. And I think rather than struggling to preserve the pr structures we have built in the last 20 years, we ought to seek to reconceptualize international our university activities, taking into consideration perhaps new technology and national relationships. Many scholars are suggesting incorporation of online international engagement in programs, both in instruction and in research. We also, I think, must make clear to the public that the COVID-19 virus represents a very clear example of how international collaboration, finding a treatment for it, international collaboration can benefit us all. So with that in mind, we have invited three outstanding speakers, as Igor has just admit, uh, just mentioned, and a very distinguished moderator. <laughs> so I hope, and I hope that everyone listening today will offer us your ideas and recommendations. Shall we move to the next speaker, Igor? Sure. Um, team? Igor, thank you, like everybody else. Uh, I'm beginning to get a little bit more nimble with my mute and unmute button, a, a skill I only acquired in the last uh, three weeks. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you so much to colleagues at UC Berkeley for the opportunity to come uh, and uh, share some thoughts with you this morning uh, and or this afternoon, depending on where you are. I've been given the rather unenviable task of identifying a precedent when clearly there is none, or at least in modern times, in terms of its impact on, on higher education. 
Uh, I will also say a few words about the financial impact and, and reflect some of the points that uh, Margaret has uh, already identified in terms of uh, the effect this is likely to have on institutions around the world for whom international students are important, but also for those uh, students themselves. Uh, and then finally offer some thoughts with respect to what this means for internationalization going forward. As, as, as you look through history, <clears throat> excuse me, and look for impact, I guess uh, in 1665, uh, the bubonic plague um, swept Europe. And, and that was a time uh, where there was the first recorded evidence that I could see of a pandemic seriously disrupting higher education. And the University of Cambridge closed. Its students were all sent home to isolate. And it was during this period that Sir Isaac Newton, while he was at home, developed calculus and discovered the laws of gravity. I've got to say, I think it's fair, it's fair to say that he was certainly considerably more productive uh, during his isolation than I've been uh, during mine so far. But in the modern era, uh, you know, clearly there is absolutely nothing, even remotely on this scale, which has affected higher education in the way that it's been challenged today. There have, of course, been a number of local and regional precedents which might help indicate the impact of singular events. So an obvious one would be uh, Hurricane Katrina when it hit New Orleans, the estimated impact on colleges and universities from lost tuition, from building repair and salary costs was off the order of $1.5 billion. And closer to home, or at least closer to home for Margaret, Igor and colleagues in Berkeley, the wildfires in Northern California last summer devastated uh, higher education there. But, but focusing on international student mobility, uh, as you've identified, Margaret, the trajectory generally since the 1970s at a global level has only tended to move in one direction. It, it's been accelerated by a number of uh, tailwinds, of course, so uh, rising affluence around the world, uh, lack of capacity in developing countries. You're not forgetting Boeing and the invention of the uh, jumbo jet and access to mass air travel. And at the same time, it's been on the receiving end of some fairly severe shocks, 9-11 being the obvious one, I guess, that most people will remember. Um, but, all, but, but for the most part, they've mostly been regional. And insofar as there is any uh, precedent uh, that I could identify, or that at least I'd like to share with colleagues on this webinar, it, it was the Asian currency crisis. And, and the reason that I mentioned the Asian currency crisis is because for many in US higher education, this was the crisis and the collapse in student enrollments that nobody really noticed. Uh, in 1997, the recession in Thailand, Malaysia, and right across the tiger economies uh, collapsed currencies, uh, devastated local incomes, you know, have uh, foreign direct investment. But in the US, between 1998 and 2005, the number of Malaysian students that have, uh, the number of Thai student enrollments fell by 43%. Uh, but the reason nobody noticed the contraction uh, was because it coincided with the initial rise of China and to some extent India. So the overall, the numbers grew. But the reason that I mention this as a precedent is not because of the economic impact and the decline in numbers, but what happened to the region itself. Because what happened was that as outbound, as outbound mobility decreased, participation or global enrollment ratios increased, and they increased very radically. Um, it's no accident that Monash University in Australia opened its first overseas campus, not in China, not in the Middle East, but in Malaysia, or that the University of Nottingham in the UK became the first UK campus overseas. So the Asian crisis, uh, what it did was it accelerated uh, some larger changes within markets uh, driven by economic shock. And 20 years later, the Southeast Asian region is now a destination hub in its own right. Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, all offer ecosystems of world-class universities, vibrant private sectors, and support the presence of large uh, universities from the developed world in a variety of uh, offshore campuses. And, and that's as true at K-12 as it is tertiary. And, and the 
the economic crisis itself didn't change the course of mobility, but what it did was it accelerated change that was already in place. Uh, and, I, and I think it, leading on to the financial issue, and I was directly um, impacted by this, uh, one of the other uh, reasons for accelerating that change was because of the sudden drop in revenues the British and Australian universities in particular who had traditionally depended on Malaysia it forced them into developing more innovative solutions it's where the one plus or the two plus twos emerged it was the three plus ones it was the supporting the um, private universities in Malaysia and, and subsequently offshore campuses and as you move forward 20 years um, in the late 90s, there were about 1.8 million mobile students, according to OECD. And today, you know, that number has risen to 5.3 million. So the financial issues, moving on to the second point, which drove the currency crisis, are, are of a magnitude much, much larger today. And uh, I know Hans will be talking about the, uh, the impact on the US, but uh, from a mobility perspective, for me, there are two dimensions to the crisis. The first is the impact on the higher education systems, which increasingly depend on foreign student revenues. And I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples. In the UK, uh, the, there is an estimate of a 47% drop in new international enrollments. They believe that that will be roughly equivalent to 2 billion US dollars. And to your point, Margaret, that is just tuition and it is just the first year of students. So on the assumption that students spend up to four years uh, overseas, uh, the, the multiplier impact is terrifying in, in, or for universities. Uh, in Canada, Alex Asher, uh, a commentator and strategist based in Toronto, estimated that between 20 and 50% of tuition for Canadian universities and colleges in Ontario and in British Columbia is dependent on foreign student revenue. And of course, anybody who is aware of Australia and its growth over the last year, a couple of years, who, who actually were the canary in the coal mine in this, uh, the Mitchell Institute at the University of Victoria estimated that they could, Australia could potentially lose between 60, uh, or between 30 and 60 billion uh, Australian dollars. The reason that I mention all of this is that for the US, it means that the competition for foreign students and international students is going to become considerably more intense because they form such a significant part of destination countries. Uh, in the US, I think S estimated a couple of weeks ago that there was a 25% enrollment decline. Now, if NAFSA figures estimate uh, the economic value of students at $41 billion, 25% of that is $10 billion. And, and, and I know that for public universities, uh, that would be even more significant. Uh, the impact on the wallets of the middle class is, is going to be significant during the global financial crisis. China's GDP was growing, but in, in this environment, every, everybody's, every middle class parent's wallet is likely to be hit one way or another. And of course, uh, just to add to the perfect storm, uh, you, you have the collapse in oil prices, which uh, will likely affect the number of sponsored students. Now, does that mean in turn that this is the end of internationalization as we know it? Because it, it, it sounds like a you're pretty grim picture. And there is no doubt that COVID has significantly disrupted glo global student flows. Uh, this fall, I think it's uh, prudent for everybody to expect significantly lower numbers of international students on their campuses. And, and that may last for a little bit longer. However, uh, two things. Number one is the immediate fundamentals are strong. Uh, many of you will have seen surveys. We, we've consolidated 12 of them uh, from the US, from the UK, from Australia, and in market. And there are uh, four points which are coming out very clearly. Number one is that very few students intend to cancel their plans to study overseas. If anything, and ironically, and you see this from the QS sur survey, if anything, the desire to study overseas intensifies as lockdown continues rather than diminishes. However, deferral is increasingly becoming 
uh, the more, I guess, realistic option for students. So again, according to study portals uh, in Europe and QS in the UK or in, in uh, globally, uh, approximately 67 to 70% of students will defer. Online uh, is growing, whether it's a black swan moment is, is a different issue, but oh, it's growing in acceptance. Universities have done a phenomenal job in, and, and ourselves and others in terms of developing it, but it's not seen as a long-term solution by students are not on its own. And that's to do with uh, certain drivers. And then the fourth point, and I think this is really important for the US, the desire to leave home is being tempered by increased anxiety. And that anxiety in China now, 80% of Chinese students when they are surveyed are asked, what is the number one factor affecting your decision? It's public health and well-being are, are the two things which are affecting them. So the extent to how the US handles the crisis uh, is going to be very, very important. Um, I, I know there are questions later about uh, uh, attitudes towards China, which I'll leave for them. So uh, I, I guess long term, uh, the opportunities are there. And, and, and ultimately, uh, th this crisis, like the Asian financial crisis, has provoked some really interesting uh, responses. Will it change mobility? No, it may well accelerate changes. So I look at uh, yesterday or the day before the University of Arizona, uh, best in uh, Tucson, announced a, uh, a fairly ambitious campaign to blend online learning with local delivery uh, as part of a global campus network. Uh, it's something I haven't seen before, or at least not on the scale uh, that the University of, of Arizona is planning and and it's an indication of of the sort of innovative responses uh, which this uh, crisis will accelerate and it takes me back to 1997 uh, and the Asian financial crisis and that being the catalyst for the growth of TNE. Um, from our perspective, as I say, we believe. Uh, that the demand is there. We believe that the attraction of the world-class universities, including Californian universities, uh, will endure. Uh, but in terms of just finishing very, very quickly, the uh, three pieces of advice that I would offer to universities or, or, or to anybody for that matter, number one is resilience. Uh, students still need to be recruited. They will come overseas. They need to be reassured and they need to be supported. And that means that as, as, a, as a community, we need a commitment to transcend this immediate crisis. Number two, obviously, is agility. Uh, so uh, the what this crisis has done is shown higher education around the world that when it's short, shorn of unnecessary process and presented with incredible challenge, we've managed to move mountains and to, uh, to achieve things in weeks, which traditionally have taken decades. Uh, so and we need to... Uh, apply that to this uh, cohort of incoming students um, in terms of flexibility and in terms of acknowledging that the recovery to this pandemic is very likely to be asymmetric. And then finally, um, I, I think ultimately this needs to be driven by a sense of empathy. There isn't a single person on planet Earth, well, maybe those on the International Space Station, who is not affected by this crisis one way or another. We genuinely are all in this together. And for me, it is vital that we understand uh, you know, that uh, that includes every student hoping to go overseas. It includes every system. It includes, it's about acknowledging that they are not a homogenous group of students. The drivers will vary. Uh, the options will vary. How we meet their needs will vary. But one thing is for sure, the demand for uh, and the role of higher education globally is going to become more rather than uh, less important and nowhere more so than uh, in California, which uh, clearly is home to some of the world's uh, finest universities, both public and private. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tim, uh, for um, um, somewhat optimistic view, optimistic perspective of the future of uh, international higher ed. I'm uh, looking at uh, our chat window and I see that there are people from all over the world and um, like India, Brazil, Colombia, um, Kazakhstan, and a lot of other countries. I'm just fascinated how much sacrifices people make to participate in the session because I know it's night somewhere. Um, and uh, our next speaker, um, Rajika Bandari. Uh, Rajika, 
Thank you, Igor and Margaret, for planning this um, wonderful and much needed webinar and your excellent series that's ongoing. And greetings to everybody around the world in different time zones and for staying up to listen to us. So we're very grateful for your time. And um, I guess I'm going to start by putting that question right out there that, that this panel has, uh, has posed, which is that, you know, is internationalization, is this the end of it? Is it declining? Or are we really looking at a reinvention? And um, it's, a, it's a provocative question indeed with no clear answer, but I'm going to lean towards the latter saying that it is indeed a time of rethinking and reinvention. Um, in our field, we've been talking about internationalization 2.0, and I think this is now 3.0. Um, but I think the difference is that all of the conversations around this over the past few years, and many of us on this call have been involved in various efforts around redefining internationalization, have almost felt like academic and theoretic discussions until now, because now is a time, the sort of urgency that we are seeing now for higher education to reinvent itself to the needs of students is something that we haven't really seen before. So, so with that framing, I'm going to um, share my thoughts around uh, four or five key issues and sort of leading into that idea of um, how does internationalization, or in the context of internationalization, how do universities need to reinvent themselves? The first thing I'm going to say is that universities really need to rethink what is the value proposition of an international experience. And that with everything that we are seeing playing out around COVID-19, and with students now being able to consider very good opportunities that will keep them at home or close to home, um, now more than ever universities have to really think about the framing of what is it that that international experience is truly offering um, students. And I think one of the key areas that's going to become even more important is the links to employment and preparing students for a very uncertain future. Um, once we emerge from this post COVID-19 world, students are going to face an altered world, both in terms of what higher education is going to look like, but also the workforce. We, we don't even know what industries and sectors are going to survive and thrive after this crisis, and, and therefore what jobs within those sectors are really going to um, rise to the top. Um, so how universities will prepare students, whether those stu all students, whether they're domestic or international students, will be very, very critical. Um, with international students, they've just faced so many barriers, particularly when we think about the US in the past few years, political barriers, social barriers, and now COVID-19, that universities will need to work even harder to make the international experience valuable for international students and continue to attract them. And I think one of the links there is really thinking about what is the applicability and relevance of that international experience once the education is over. Um, Tim, my, my second point is sort of around this idea of um, what's going to happen to institutions in the global north and the global, um, uh, global south. And I think both Tim and Margaret alluded to this, that um, traditionally the movement of, um, of expertise, of knowledge, of international students has always been from the developing world to the developed world. Um, and some would also argue and, you know, to, to sort of quote Phil Altpark that it has almost been a, a form of uh, neo-colonization um, when we look at sort of the, how movement and expertise has, has, has transferred. And I think that with what we are seeing right now, one of the shifts that we are going to see is sort of this real rebalancing that's going to occur because many of those countries, uh, and again, someone else alluded to this, from which a lot of the global talent has gone to and served countries like the US, the UK, Australia, the, the, the sort of typical global powers and destinations have also been building their own capacity. And so I think 
what is needed is for US institutions to really engage with institutions in other countries in a much more holistic way and with partner universities in a much more holistic way. And in a way where internationalization is much more com comprehensive and engaging the whole ecosystem, rather than just being grounded in this very narrow idea of student mobility. And I know that right now, um, the focus is very much on mobility because universities are sort of reeling from what that loss in enrollments is going to mean to their bottom line. Um, but really, if we are to think of this in a broader way and to think about sustainability, and I think that's sort of one of the key issues for US universities, that if we think about what is really sustainable or internationalization that's really sustainable, it's really going to depend on those deeper, longer term engagements with um, other countries as, as equal partners. That also leads into my third point, which I'm not, I'm just gonna mention because I think it's very important, but I know Hans is gonna go deeper into this. So I won't say a whole lot about it, but that we are going to see an even bigger strengthening of the idea of internationalization at home, which has of course already been growing um, quite strongly over the past few years. But now again, I think we're going to see it sharpen um, and expand in a way that we have not really seen um, earlier. And of course, there are many variations to what internationalization at home looks like. Um, but I think related to that, what we're also going to see, at least within the US context, is an expansion of the offshore model that Tim talked about, that countries like the UK and Australia have really sort of uh, uh, led the field in that regard. And, um, you know, I, I haven't looked at the most, I will admit I've not looked at the most current statistics, but until very recently uh, for a country like the UK, their offshore enrollments were actually larger than the number of actual physical bodies of international students um, in the UK. So I think we're going to see that model adopted more by, by US universities who haven't uh, been as aggressive um, in pursuing offshore uh, models as have some other uh, countries. My third point is around um, that I'd like to share is around national policies. And I know that the focus of this discussion is universities, but national policies will be absolutely critical. Um, Tim used the word competition. And we have seen this global competition heating up already over the past few years. And again, I think that's going to be um, uh, the, the competition is going to heat up much more in, because of um, the, 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 the overall pool of mobile students now being somewhat uh, constricted and everybody uh, you know, competing for the same pool of the world's best and brightest. And in the context of the US, you know, international student numbers were already in peril prior to COVID and which has now created, and I, I had this phrase in my notes too, and, and, and Tim already used it, it's really created a perfect storm. Um, no one has control over the COVID-19 situation, but let's at least make sure that other policies, um, that other policies will help the US remain attractive to international students. It's very important to preserve the flow of students because again, looking in a longer term view, and I'm not gonna share any statistics here because this is well documented, but we know that it, when we think about science, innovation and entrepreneurship in the US, it is very much of a pipeline where a lot of the developments that we've seen over the past several decades, and you know, no better place to observe this than California, which is home to Silicon Valley, has really been fed by the world's best and brightest, by the world's global talent that has entered the US at sort of the front part of that pipeline, which is higher education. So universities need to have a much stronger voice in ensuring that international students continue to be attracted to the US first and foremost for its stellar higher education system, but also for opportunities that exist for them after they finish their education. And I, what I will say is that it's, it's, it's fair to assume that if universities want to attract the world's best and brightest, that those best and brightest are then going to want the best opportunities for themselves, wherever those opportunities may lie, whether they lie in the country where they've studied or whether those opportunities lie back home 
or even in a third country. Um, in the spirit of sort of taking the discussion more global, um, I guess sort of the, the before I end, the fifth main point what I want to, uh, that I want to make is really um, this idea of what is the global responsibility of universities as they think about shaping future generations? And, um, you know, Tim, Tim um, ended on a very important and humanitarian note of, you know, all of us going through a time where we're really being called upon to think about what our ethics are, what our values are, and of uh, being uh, good and humane citizens. And I feel that we as, when we think about internationalization, we are still looking at this very narrow lens for countries like the US, looking at this very narrow lens of taking rather than giving. Yet, if institutions in the US are to sustain, they need to think about their internationalization goals within a broader framework of global responsibility, of sustainable development, and really building longer term engagement with different countries, universities within those countries, and, um, and their education systems. And universities all over the world have a responsibility to train global talent, regardless of of where that talent comes from. Just based on demographic growth and where that future uh, talent pool is coming from, US universities will need to partner effectively and equitably with high schools and universities in regions such as South Asia and Africa. With that, and you know, here I'm going to sort of also end on a note similar to Tim's, but I think uh, it is a very important note that, and, and I want to be very clear that I'm not dismissing the very, very real concerns that exist. But I do want to emphasize that the appeal of a traditional in-person experience remains strong. And we've been so, and I come from the world of surveys myself, and as, as, as some of you know, I've been immersed in surveys like Open Doors and others for, um, for many years, but I'm finding myself at a point where I need to extricate myself from what the larger scale surveys and numbers tell me and really get down to what some of the stories and nuances are, which we can really get from speaking with students. So I've been talking and listening to students very carefully. And what I'm hearing is that most students are viewing the idea of online provision as a band-aid. And that there's a huge difference between studying online versus being on um, campus. One gives you information and knowledge and the other gives you a true education and has the potential to be transformative. And we can't shape global citizens and enable education diplomacy through Zoom University, but we can certainly do so through institutions like UC Berkeley. And if we think about what California has to offer, um, the, the, the University of California system is of course huge but it's also got the largest community college system in the US. There are many factors that have typically attracted international students to California. First and foremost, the quality and reputation of the institutions. If we look at the Open Doors rankings, um, I believe five of the UC universities are among the top 20. If we also include the University of Southern California, that's six California institutions that are on that list. One of the things that has always attracted students to California um, are the, are the um, large immigrant communities and the diaspora that exists from world regions such as Asia, as well as Latin America, which is incredible, an, an incredibly powerful attractor and driver for international students as they think about different locations um, in the US because of the strong cultural and historical connections that, ca that California communities have to some of those world, um, to, world to some of those world regions. So, I do believe that the Made in America brand, the Made in America credential that international students so want, and, and if we take it narrower, that, that Made in California brand is going to continue to be very appealing to, um, to students. 
Uh, thank you, Rajika, for providing such a broad perspective on uh, on international higher education. And uh, um, I, I, I'm I'm looking at the questions in chat. And uh, uh, please please send your questions. I encourage you to send more. We'll we'll address them after our last speaker, uh, Hans David. Uh, Hans. Yes, thank you, Igor and Margaret, for in, uh, inviting me to this interesting uh, panel. Uh, of course, when I was approached by uh, the title at the end of re or revival of international higher education, it brought me back to uh, the essay that I wrote together with Uwe Brandenburg in 2011, so nearly 10 years ago, uh, with the provocative title of the end of internationalization. Uh, and. Uh, of course, that was in the time that uh, we saw that the values, and we talk a lot about values these days, and that's very important to think, values and principles that underline internationalization of higher education, that we saw this, the values that were in the late 80s, 90s, driving the agenda of internationalization of higher education in most countries, maybe with some exceptions like the UK and Australia, which were very much already focused on revenue generation, uh, the other areas there was a strong focus on cooperation, on exchange, on uh, uh, partnerships, and on uh, inclusion. Uh, and what we saw in in those twenty years that go until uh, uh, ten years ago, we saw that uh, the trend was much more from cooperation to competition, as Marek van der Wende, my Dutch colleague, has said. Uh, the trend was much more on. Uh, economic rationales driving internationalization. We started much more than cooperation. We started to compete for students. We started to compete for scholars. We started to compete for positions in rankings, for access to top publications. So certainly the driving agenda shifted very much from cooperation to that competitive environment. And in that essay and later also in uh, the myths of internationalization by Jay Knight, uh, my own misconceptions of internationalization. We, we challenged those kind of issues and we were wondering, is that really the internationalization we want to have? And although that uh, caught a lot of attention and also other similar streams like the internationalization at home movement in, uh, that started in Europe in already at uh, 1999 and spread all over the world, the movement for internationalization of the curriculum in Australia and the UK as a response to this whole revenue generation activities. Uh, still, we saw that uh, that trend is still dominant. Uh, a, a dominant focus on revenue generation, uh, a very focus on mobility and a very elitist mobility of only a very small percentage of students. Uh, that has been driving uh, the agenda of internationalization um, until now. And uh, then you can question, indeed, what is the impact of COVID-19? Of course, there has been reference also by Tim on past crises like the Asian crisis and 9-11 uh, and the financial crisis of 2008 and the impact that had. And what we saw in all those crises is there was a quick re, uh, return to the normal. And uh, the big question is, will that happen in COVID-19 as well? And in that, I think we have to be clear that we, uh, uh, we have to look at context. The impact will, you, can, you cannot talk about internationalization in general terms because context is very different. Context by region, it will be different in North America, it will be different in Asia and Africa and Latin America. It will be different by institutions. So for the top research universities, not much will change. So even the University of California, uh, given its reputation, will continue to have a key role in the recruiting international top talents, including international scholars, uh, uh, partnerships, etc. cetera. Uh, but that might be different by uh, a lot of other public institutions of higher education in the United States might be different in uh, private higher education in developing countries. So uh, we cannot really generalize when we talk about this kind of questions. Uh, we also have to look at the short term, medium term and long term impact of this crisis. Uh, what is going to happen for sure is uh, what several people already have mentioned, 
uh, it is basically an acceleration of a trend what was already happening. The market share of the top countries, in particular the United States, of recruiting international students was already decreasing. There was much more competition from Asia in particular, but also from, from uh, Central Asia, from Europe, and even in Africa and Latin America. Uh, so what will happen now is an acceleration process. Uh, that is one thing. The second thing will happen is that, of course, the leading countries in the world uh, will be first and foremost affected. That's always the case. Uh, because if you are so dependent, as has been said by Tim and also uh, by Rijeka, uh, that universities have become so dependent on international students and there will be a drop, it will have an enormous impact. Even if it is true, like Tim said, that only 20% or 30% of the students will defer or stop to go to study abroad, that impact will be already enormous on many institutions in the United States, in, the, uh, in Australia and in the UK. So the impact will be there and will they recover? Huh? Simon Markinson said in, an, uh, in University World News, it will take five years for mobility to recover. I would say maybe yes, but will that recovery be that still the students go in the same directions? Or will they move to somewhere else? Will they indeed move much more to Asia? Uh, we have seen already that China, Malaysia, Taiwan uh, be, have become big uh, receivers of international students. Uh, we see that India is trying to enter the market. We see that Russia is entering the market. We see that uh, uh, South Korea, uh, which was a big sending country, now uh, is mainly becoming a receiving country. Uh, so it might be that the direction, what already was happening, is an accelerated process going away from the leading Western countries, English speaking countries, to other countries. We have to see if that is really happening and how it's happening. And there might be other factors that play a role. We talk now a lot about uh, issues like safety and wellness. Tim uh, has referred to that as well. That might be a much more decisive factor for students where to go to. And then you can question, OK, the xenophobia against Asians and against Africans uh, and Latin uh, Latinos in, in the Western world is very strong. But we also see similar trends in China. We see similar trends in India against African students, which was where most African students recently went to. So maybe they feel, well, we don't go there either because we are not welcome. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how students uh, choose. Uh, the impact of the middle class will be an important factor as well. And I, I am in that sense uh, having the feeling that uh, we will see drastic more changes than in previous crises happening, and it will impact the big receiving countries, in particular the UK and the United States. A little bit less Australia, a little bit less Canada, uh, but also they will be impacted. And what I find an irony to understand is that uh, the United States, which is the current Roman Empire, is not feeling yet that it is falling apart. That if you look, of course, at the Trump administration, they still think we are the greatest, etc. But also higher education has still a tendency to think we are the greatest. If you look at universities are saying, well, we are open in the fall and international students are welcome. And at the same time, they say, we don't send our students to study abroad because not safe everywhere. That's turning things upside down because the most unsafe area in COVID-19 is the United States. And other countries are much more safe, uh, with some exceptions, of course, like Italy and Spain, but they are also much more on the recovery side. So there is this arrogancy that we are still the greatest and we can uh, recruit uh, still the international students and they come. And I think, and on that in a sense, I'm more on the pessimistic side, and Philip Albach and I have been writing about that also on University News, that the first thing that institutions will do as soon as there is some kind of opening uh, is the reset button. They're going back to business as usual. They're going aggressively to recruit international students. They're going to drop online education uh, because they want to go back to the normal and think that's possible. And I, I question if that's really the, 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 the future. Uh, I think it's not going to happen, 
uh, besides the fact that it should not happen. And it's not going to happen because, uh, as I said, there will be movements in different directions, there will be much more competition, uh, and there will also much more be uncertainty to the fact that if it's really safe and is it affordable to go to these countries in the future. On the study abroad side for credit, so that's what mainly is the, uh, the second driving force in the United States and in, in Europe, uh, which is something like between 10 and 20% of the student uh, body going for a, a short term abroad, uh, I think that uh, in Europe it will not so much be affected because it will be much more focused on uh, the Erasmus program scholarship schemes that are available. I think it will have a much more negative impact in the United States uh, because of uh, financial reasons, because of feeling like uncertainty and uh, uncertainty, etc. So there is also a different context. But if we talk to the global south, like also Rajika has done, I think there is an interesting situation there because international education has not been very active because of the fact there were not many international students going to those countries, in particular if you talk to Africa and Latin America, and there were also very few students going abroad. So in that sense, the COVID-19 crisis will not impact that much. And what I see there is the opportunity uh, that is developing. The opportunity, what already was happening in those regions, was that they were much already more focusing on internationalization at home. You saw that they were saying, well, our students don't have the means to go abroad. International students don't come to our countries, uh, but we still want to have for our students uh, the inter international intercultural competences that they need. So how are we going to do that? We're going to do that by internationalization at home. And what I've seen over the past, in, in particular in Latin America, is that so many institutions have been coming uh, adapted to collaborative online international learning, which was, of course, developed in the United States by the, uh, the SUNY system, uh, but has been having an enormous response in many countries in, in Latin America, but also in Africa, because they saw that there's the opportunity. And we now have uh, the possibility to have our students meet with students and faculty from other parts of the world online. And as my friend and colleague, Marcelo Noble, the rector of Universidad Campinas in Brazil said, we see now opportunities. We see now suddenly that we can have Zoom meetings, that we can have other platforms where our students uh, can meet students and faculty. So the whole COVID crisis in that sense has accelerated an opportunity for the global South to say, well, this is our chance to really to be connected to the world without being an elitist approach. And that I think makes it very interesting to see how the response will be in the uh, Western world. I think, again, I'm pessimistic. I, I, I don't see that uh, the, uh, the lessons learned from COVID-19 by higher education in the Western world will be very high uh, at the short term. Uh, they only will realize in the long term that the impact has been very much affecting them in a negative way. So what to do? And I was pleasantly surprised that both Tim and Radika ended on a positive note and talking about the need of uh, uh, values and responsibilities. And when I was uh, preparing, I came back to something that I wrote in 2018 with my friend and colleague, Jay Knight, for a book by uh, Dr. Sprachter and Laura Rumley. And I, I quote this uh, here because I think it's much more important now than it was two years ago. And we wrote, as we look backwards and forwards, it's important to ask one question. What are the core principles and values underpinning internationalization of higher education that 10 or 20 years from now will make us look back and be proud of the track record and contribution that international higher education has made to the more interdependent world we live in, the next generation of citizens and the bottom billion people living in poverty, poverty around the planet. I think what we wrote then 
uh, is after this COVID crisis much more important than ever. We have to make an appeal to our leaders in higher education that the world has to change, that we have to have an internationalization that supports the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, that is really there not only for career planning for individuals or for rankings or for revenue generation, but it's really driving us to help society to overcome crises like COVID-19, to help the world to become a better planet with climate change, etc. That I think will be a revival of the old values of internationalization. And that requires a lot of reimaginization of how we can improve the direction instead of simply putting on the reset button to a competitive internationalization approach. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Hans. Uh, thanks uh, all of the panelists today. Um, and now I suggest we move to a uh, Q&A section of uh, our panel. Uh, again, as I said at the beginning, uh, we'll uh, stay uh, half an hour or more. So we try to address as many questions as possible. And um, uh, I suggest we start, there are a lot of questions about the differential impact of the COVID-19 on different types of institutions, different countries. Um, we have a lot of participants from California. So um, uh, from your presentation, I kind of got a sense that uh, universities in California should not worry about uh, the impact of pandemic, that especially University of California should be fine. Uh, do, you have to, do, do you have anything to add to that message? Well, if, if I may start again, I, I mean, uh, yes, it will not have a, a long term impact. It might have still a short term impact, like everybody will be short term impacted. But uh, to add to that, as, as Rajika also said, there are different types of institutions of higher education and the system of, of, of California. And so it might be different for the community colleges uh, than it will be for the research universities and for the other universities, more teaching institutions. Uh, I think on the local side, community colleges uh, in California and the United States in general might benefit from this crisis because many students, local students, will be uh, deferring to community colleges because it's much more affordable. And if in the, the payment rate and the lack of financing make it much more difficult for them to go to higher education um, in an, an expensive way. So in the local context, that might uh, have an impact. And it might even, to a certain extent, make community college also more international. Uh, it, I'm, I'm much more worried on the not so much top research universities and teaching institutions in the public sector in the United States and the smaller uh, private colleges, because they both were already in financial crisis uh, for demographic reasons. Uh, they were increasingly more dependent on international students for revenue generation as compensation for lack of state funding, and they will be much more imp impacted than the University of California, and even, I think, more than community colleges. But that's my uh, assumption. All right, Rajika? Yeah, I just want to be clear that when I talked about the strength of, uh, or, the, or the enduring appeal of California, I am by no means suggesting that this is a time of complacency for any institution anywhere. So my point, my, my point rather is that yes, there is very strong appeal for California and the institutions within it, but absolutely every institution in the US, every institution in major destination countries has to be thinking about those lines of how do they, um, refine or reinvent how they view internationalization for the future. This is not a time for anybody to sort of sit by on their laurels and think that we'll get by because we're high in the rankings, whether it be global rankings or the open doors rankings, but more that what are those key areas around, you know, that Hans has talked a lot about this, uh, Margaret alluded to it in her opening remarks, what are those financial and funding models that need to be rethought? How do institutions um, broaden their global engagement uh, 
of course universities in california are already very global but again you know we we th this is an unprecedented time so really thinking about how to broaden that and then that third um i think theme uh, that's also emerging from our discussion is sort of that idea of uh, really embracing the, the 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 true founding values of internationalization which are now more important than ever so i i, I did want to clarify that point that um, it's really a time for change, but yes, there are certain factors that are already uh, placing California in a place of strength as compared with some other regions in the country. Thank you so much, team. You want to add something to that? Your, your mic is muted. Yes, thank you, I Igor. Uh, uh, I would have just wanted to pick up on, on one or two things which the panelists have said with respect uh, to California. Uh, clearly, uh, as Rajika says, and as Hans says, uh, uh, California is home to an amazingly rich ecosystem of uh, universities and colleges and community colleges, including, of course, uh, you know, some of the world's most powerful um, brands, higher education brands. Um, we are publishing a white paper with NEFSA and with the APLU in June. Uh, we've done a significant amount of data analysis looking at the factors which drive um, enrollment growth, particularly in times of cha challenge. So we looked at, uh, uh, we took iPads data from I think 2015 to 2018 and put in an enormous range of variables. And, and it is absolutely true that location matters and will make a difference. But it is, it is not enough to insulate oneself against the, the challenges. So when we did the analysis and, and we looked at uh, ranking, Carnegie classification, location, control, whether it was public or private, uh, and so forth. And, and what was really interesting to us were, were three things came out very, very strongly on this, which gives me you know, certainly confidence for, for uh, uh, Berkeley. Uh, no, number one is that uh, the, the strongest correlation we could find between growth and in international enrollments um, and, and uh, against decline was the, the, the ranking or the selectivity of an institution. So generally speaking, uh, not a, an absolutely perfect correlation, but, but the, the more selective the institution, the more likely it was to grow international numbers. Now, th th that, that may well be an obvious point. The second one was whether or not there was a sizable international student population there already. And the magic number was about two and a half thousand. So, if it was more than two and a half thousand students, uh, the university was more likely to grow international enrollments uh, than would otherwise be the case. And again, given the sort of global diaspora that lives in California, uh, you know, across the CSU system and this, the, the UC system, as well as the privates, uh, that would put it in, in good uh, stage. The, the third factor, which was an interesting one, surprised us, but uh, I guess, uh, you know, given uh, where I work, it shouldn't, uh, but it was the extent to which external partnerships were involved. So sometimes when resources are constrained, the ability to seek additional resource to drive international mission uh, becomes more important. But I, I particularly wanted to pick up hence on what you said, uh, which is, uh, or the point you made that there, there may be a temptation for universities to push a reset button once a vaccine is developed or once a new normal. And, and, and I think that would be a tragedy. The, uh, what, what, what we have learned through this crisis and what universities have achieved through this crisis for me will be what drives success uh, going forwards. Um, and, and if we push a reset button where we impose artificial caps on students or we decide as a sector that we can admit these students, we can't admit those students, you know, for decades there were, uh, you know, it's not possible to, to admit students without SAT scores. Now, of course, uh, the U United States has, you know, for, to a large extent has gone test optional. Uh, there's nothing that can't be done. So for me, uh, a lot of this and the reason I picked up on the University of Arizona and, and, and identified the financial crisis in 1997 is that it, if you have uh, liquidity and some resilience, but most of all, if you've got a vision and you're prepared to execute it on it, then that I think 
will uh, protect universities as much as reputation, as much as resources, as much as anything else. Um, that's what drove the TNE expansion. That's why Monash, you know, you know, is a global leader in transnational education, and and, and so leadership driven by resources with a focus on what matters to students, which is outcomes these days, uh, I think will, will protect most universities going forward. I, I completely agree with Hens. If, if people push the reset button, then even I'm not even sure that the Californian institutions, despite their magnificent assets uh, and magnificent um, um, reputations, will, will, will be completely immune, if you forgive the term, uh fr from the global competition and the more flexible nimble partnerships which are likely to emerge as we go forward thank you so much um so uh rajika mentioned uh and i think hans in, in in your talk you also mentioned that as well um do you think that health security will be an important criteria for which students choose a country or a university to study in the future. And also related to that, we know that global rankings, global university rankings, they, um, they have a very important component, international, the number of international students is a very important component. Do you think the rankings will change as well? Uh, and the, the way students choose universities will change? Let me start and maybe Rajika wants to join as well, but uh, two, two different questions, but let, let me start with the first one on, on the health uh, issue and uh, I think that we already saw that uh, students watch more are were concerned about and, and parents also about health and wellness and safety issues. Uh, I think the COVID-19 crisis has been really uh, had an, an impact on that as a more important point of attention by parents and students than ever before. So I think it will have an impact on where students will go for both for credit study abroad as for full degree study abroad. Uh, certainly much more on, on credit mobility. Uh, parents will have a strong influence because that's uh, in the undergraduate level anyway. Uh, but I will see that. And so it will also be interesting to see how, uh, how that impacts in the sense of choices. We, I, I mentioned already, uh, can you question if China and countries like Russia, which have a target for international student mobility incoming, uh, will they not be affected by the fact that uh, China was the cause of uh, COVID-19 and all the negative impact that uh, governments currently from Australia and the and US, et cetera, put onto China, will that, reduce the interest in going to China? Will the fact that Russia seems to be very much affected also impact them? And so might other countries, uh, South Korea, for instance, might that benefit? Uh, might Taiwan uh, benefit much more than China because they were much better in uh, controlling the COVID-19 crisis? Might a country like Germany, uh, which has the advantage of, uh, it was doing very well in handling the crisis. It is uh, low cost, no tuition fees. It is uh, welcoming. Uh, might that have a more positive impact than other countries which have been much more negative? So I think part of that is indeed the wellness factor and that plays a role. On, on the second question, rankings, uh, I, I have not seen much of an effort by rankings really to change. So I, I don't think so. But there, there might probably will uh, do another ranking, uh, like uh, nearly every week a ranking. So now maybe they do a ranking about uh, which universities are the most safe and uh, putting uh, attention to health. That might happen. Uh, but at the end, if that has an impact, I don't know. Uh, I think still uh, rankings play, unfortunately, a big role in decision making. Uh, but uh, as we always know, it's only a small percentage of the institutions around the world that are ranked in the world rankings. And so uh, uh, the most students don't go to the Yoshi universities. And uh, so you have to look at other factors as well that play a role. And then wellness might be, uh, and, and safety and health might be a factor. So uh, that's my view, but maybe Rajika wants Thank you. to- Thank you, Rajika, do you want to add something? Yeah, um, 
I wanted to sort of add from, you know, from sort of, again, two different questions here, but from that perspective of how students and families assess risk, um, just wanted to sort of share a historical perspective on what some of the data shows from open doors for the US, uh, which of course measures um, student mobility into the US as well as out of the US. And it's very interesting where what you see is, and you know, I think prior to COVID-19, sort of the biggest, of course, it wasn't a health crisis, but to the extent that one thinks about it as a crisis to one's well-being and life was the, was the whole gun violence issue. And basically the patterns that we see are anytime there are sort of these horrific incidents, um, the student interest starts dropping, but applications and admissions are a long cycle and then you see those numbers begin to pick up again and we've seen this at repeated points in history and I think Tim walked us through a wonderful chronicle of what history really tells us about how countries and universities recover from some of these big upsets in history so I think um, how families and students assess risk does change over time but related to that is this point that you know we're talking about risk just in the context of the public health issue but the reality right now for students is that it's about the actual literal mobility countries are completely shut down um and 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 if i look at sort of even a country like india and i just had a conversation with some students the other day and, and what one of them said was I am reassessing my options. I have admission from a top institution at home, but I'm very worried about going overseas and getting stuck. And that, that's part of it. It's not so much when will the cures be found, et cetera. That's a large part of it. But it's also that the borders are shut down completely right now. Um, I didn't look at the situation, the, the update today or very recently, but until you know, very recently, visas couldn't be issued for someone wanting to even leave India and come to the US. A country like India has its borders completely shut, so no one can enter back. So the very sort of notion of mobility right now is a very sort of the idea of crossing a border is a very theoretical one. So I think that's sort of an actual barrier that we're not talking about. And when will that recovery happen of, uh, you know, all the policies, et cetera, being in place for people to actually uh, move. And then the second point and the second question, I did want to share that I do think rankings, um, you know, and I, I, uh, I, I disagree with Hans here because I do think that rankings are beginning to take into account the different metrics that they ought to be looking at. And um, in fact, just a few years ago, one of the big ranking systems, Time, Times Higher Ed, actually made a commitment in response to what they were hearing that it is not enough to look at sort of the narrow um, you know, metrics that already exist or the narrow indicators that already exist, even on the international front. And they made a concerted effort to actually measure and rank universities and how they're responding to the sustainable development goals. And I believe that they released their first set of rankings. Was it last? Uh, I think it was last year. Now, you know, that can be a whole discussion in itself. And I could see Hans smiling. So I'm not kind of I'm not opening that can of worms here for us to discuss the um, the merits or the the gaps in those rankings, but only to say that I think that there's an effort at least being made to consider that the value of um, universities and what their roles and responsibilities are ought to be looked at in a, in a much and assessed in a much broader sense than research grants and sort of the typical metrics that currently exist. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, let, let's move on to the next uh, to the next question. I think it's uh, it's very important to address. Um, uh, we are all, I think, overwhelmed with information right now and looking at different places. You know. Uh, so, where can we get up-to-date information on decisions individual university make regarding mobility policies? And what sources do you read to uh, kind of a, to make sense what's going on? What are university strategies? Um, what do you recommend? Well, Tim, can you go ahead first? Yeah, Tim. I am um, 
I came across a phrase the other day, which, which I'd heard for the first time, which I think probably describes almost uh, everybody, which was a condition called infobesity, uh, where you are so overwhelmed with information that rather than, than help uh, inform decision-making, actually what it does is paralyze choice. And that's to some extent uh, where, where I am at the moment. Uh, or how we feel at the moment. I, I, we are in a fortunate position, I guess, uh, an organization like Into, because although we are best in the United States, uh, we're also best all over the world. So we have colleagues in almost every country. So rather like Rajika was saying earlier about having conversations with students in India, we're able to have those conversations in, in Korea, India, uh, uh, Indonesia and so forth. So to some extent, I feel blessed at having access to that, um, um, that, that immediate information. There are a number of assets. I mean, clearly the uh, CVIS data and the iPads data and so forth that's available in the United States is, is an enormously rich resource. It needs mining, it needs insight, it needs a lot of interpretation, but, but the C uh, open doors, you know, is wonderful, but CVIS actually, when they do publish, publish even more up-to-date information. We use that quite extensively in terms of um, decision-making and in terms of, of, of insight. Ultimately, you know, what any of these databases tell you is what's happened, not what's coming next. And of course, the extent to which you can use that as a precedent for navigating your way beyond COVID is a bit of a challenge. The other thing uh, that, that I would certainly recommend um, is that people listen to their students and listen to policymakers via social channels. Uh, I mean, clearly you have to tune a phenomenal amount of information out uh, in order to make sense of the world, but that's very helpful. And then of course, there are a number of publications, not least of which is University World News for whom Hans and Rajika both write uh, regularly, uh, monitor, ICEF Monitor, a number of others uh, around the world that do produce very helpful uh, summaries and syntheses of, of, of what is happening globally. Uh, but ultimately, you know, as I say, if you can get your ears to the ground in terms of what is happening outside the borders of the United States, as well as within the borders of the United States, that's the advice I would give. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree on the Infobasitas pointer that uh, Tim made. I mean, uh, there was an overload and, uh, of uh, uh, discussions, panels, uh, webinars like this, and the amount of people that participate in that is amazing. I mean, I, I, uh, webinars in the past, you would be happy if you got 50 people. Now uh, we have webinars with 300, 350 people from all over the world. And in itself, that's, uh, that's good because that means that you have more uh, interaction uh, if there's enough time for Q&A. Uh, &A. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think University World News is certainly a good source of uh, what is happening in the world uh, on higher education uh, at the current and a lot of discussion and blogs on that is, are very useful. But on the concrete side of what universities decide uh, about uh, international students recruitment and on study abroad, etc., I think most universities still are in the mood of uh, we try to delay the decision to as late as possible. Uh, because the implications are enormous if they make the wrong decision. If they make a decision to open up too early and there is a lift up, then you get an enormous uh, implications for the institution to reset that again and to uh, solve all the issues of uh, 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 yeah, uh, registration and accommodation, all those kind of things that we have been going through this uh, this um, this spring. Um, the same as with study abroad, uh, although I think there's a much more earlier type of decision to be made on that uh, by institutions, and they do that. Uh, but you, it's it's very difficult for institutions to make decisions at the moment. So I think mostly they will do that more by the end of June, uh, early of July that they are deciding. If I look at the discussions I have uh, uh, as faculty member with the provost and with the president of Boston College, you get the same kind of reactions. We, 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 uh, we talk with all our colleagues of universities in the United States and everybody is still really 
thinking, what do we have to do? Uh, when can we make decisions? That doesn't mean that they are need, at the same time are preparing for different scenarios. And I think that's the most important thing that universities are currently are doing. They are scenario building, and that's very important. What if this happens? What can we do and what should we do then? And how can we prepare for that? What if the opposite happens? What should we do then and how can we prepare for that? That's where all universities are the current in the current situation are busy with. And that in that, sometimes they forget the international dimension. What does it mean for international students? What does it mean for study abroad? So uh, that is important to address because the impact for international students, as we have seen in the crisis, it's much bigger than for local students. Uh, but like Rajika said, the many people that are stranded, uh, that had to go home and uh, go in quarantine, couldn't do the online education because there were firewalls against it, uh, like in China happened, or that you didn't have the right conditions at home. Uh, so uh, it is important that in scenario building of institutions, they have also to address very importantly, what does it mean for the international dimension of our institution? And I see that unfortunately not always happening well it is for them a very important factor in revenue right thanks uh i think that's uh, actually a good segue to uh next session the next kind of a block of questions that we received it's uh on the role of technology and all of you addressed this uh in your um uh, in your earlier presentations but uh the question that we got in chat uh, and, and earlier as well is what's the role of kind of the advanced online learning techniques like augmented reality, virtual reality? Uh, should universities embrace that? Should international higher education uh, kind of a professionals become more proficient with online learning? Should they uh, should it, they invest in it right now? Uh, the model, uh, the micro campus model that was discussed, is it something that univer other universities should consider? What's your take on that? I can, I can, I can start because I mean, Philip and I wrote uh, last uh, uh, weekend. Hans, Hans, let's maybe Rajika start for, for a change and, and, and then you. you I'm waiting for them, but uh, anyway, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sure, happy to um, happy to jump in uh, quickly. And absolutely, I think all of those aspects of technology are going to have a very important role to play because I think the way we have leveraged technology up until now, and even with what we've seen over the past two months, has been in a fairly passive way where technology is being used primarily as just an instructional tool. And related to that, we've seen this issue really come to the forefront of the fact that it is not just the right technology, but the pedagogy needs to change. And that, you know, we're reading and hearing this that, you know, suddenly every expert, every teacher, regardless of the level they're teaching at, every professor is being pushed online to deliver the same information and um, expertise online. But the strategies and teaching styles and pedagogies that work in person in the classroom don't necessarily translate um, uh, or, or are not transferred exactly online. So I think there's if, for the online component, there's also the pedagogical aspect of it, um, but also that even just in terms of the technology, we haven't really fully leveraged it where it's still very passive in terms of thinking about, um, you know, are we using Zoom or, or what's, what's the platform that's being used rather than technology really being central to um, envisioning the, uh, the entire, um, right from sort of the, the content, the curriculum, the delivery, the pedagogy, and that's something that we're even struggling with at the within the institute, where we've had to move a lot of our residential weeks online, and we're constantly thinking about all of those components that need to change, and how do we really bring in technology to enhance uh, the actual information and learning, which I don't think has happened enough up until now. Tim, uh, thank you, Igor. Um... I am no expert on technology, as you can tell, I can barely use a mute and unmute button, 
uh, on a computer. Uh, there's no question, there is absolutely no question uh, that technology as an enabler has uh, transformed higher education's ability to respond immediately uh, to this pandemic, uh, the extent to which, I mean, that is not the same. Uh, there's a slightly different question, which is, does COVID represent a, a sort of a black swan moment for international education, a black swan famously being a, a, a predictable, an unpredictable event which changes the course of history uh, retrospectively? Uh, I, I'm not sure on that for a number of reasons. Uh, of course, one can use, I've seen some astonishing examples of how technology is deployed, uh, beaming professors around the world, asynchronous learning. Clearly, we use a lot of that. Even within Into, we deploy AI in terms of understanding admissions. We've just ourselves launched a, an online platform. Uh, we need to remember a couple of things with respect to this, it seems to me. The first is that, uh, in the United States, where most technology is developed, 97% uh, of the population have broad, broadband access and are connected to the internet. In sub-Saharan Africa, that drops to about 35% and actually 9% in rural areas. So there's an equity issue, I guess, uh, in the first instance. The second thing is that, um, particularly in mobility, which is the area that I'm interested in and in students traversing the world. Uh, the credential is part of what a student is looking for. And that can, you know, can that be delivered online? Absolutely. Uh, it can be delivered online, but, but what can't be delivered online or what is much more challenging are the other things which are important to students, which, which Rajika has identified. Um, the, experiences that they will acquire from uh, mixing with students in a real classroom, the um, experiences that they acquire from moving from one country to another, gaining work experience and so forth. Uh, all of those are going to be very, very difficult to replicate online. The parallel that I use is we all of us uh, on this computer screen and on uh, I guess joining us on the webinar have been subject to social distancing and restrictions and have used Zoom um, socially as well as professionally. Now, I don't know about everybody else, but when, the, uh, when this lockdown is lifted, the fact that I can have a virtual dinner party with my friends on Zoom is not going to make me turn around when the lockdown restrictions are lifted and say, you know what, guys, I shall raise a glass of Malbec to you here and, and won't meet you for dinner. Humans are social animals and they need, uh, you know, and I think technology makes an enormous difference. It's an enabler, it changes the world. Absolutely, it should, it plays an increasing role, but we shouldn't forget uh, that there is another dimension to this as well, which is the human dimension. And, and that will remain to be important for years to come. Right, Hans? Yeah, very briefly, because I think we are close to time. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, technology uh, will have an accelerated impact on higher education because of the COVID crisis, because everybody was faced with the reality that suddenly we had to move there. Will it completely go in the direction that it will replace on site? No. Uh, will it, uh, uh, we have seen in the past like that, people said that MOOCs will be the, the changing revolution into higher education it didn't happen either. This will also not happen uh, with COVID-19 that it will lead people to on, uh, 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 online. Uh, it will help, hopefully, and that's very important, to make people much more aware about the possibilities that online has to enhance the quality of our learning. There is a, di a difference between uh, somebody in a webinar with the International Association of Universities, which we had this week, said between emergency teaching online and learning online. And I think we have to focus on the learning online side, uh, how uh, we can students be much more interactive with faculty and with other students online, in, both internationally and locally. Uh, if that is going to happen, then it has a very positive effect on higher education quality. If it is going to the mood, we have to replace the one thing by the other, then it will have the disastrous impacts because 
as I think the um, the president of Spelman uh, College said in the in the other uh, uh, seminar, the Qatar Foundation and the econ uh, economist said uh, for undergraduate in particular, the community of students and faculty on site is so important. If you take that away, then you don't have quality education, certainly not at the undergraduate level. So let's not hope that that is going to happen. Let's create still that communities and let's use technology as part of that community instead of instead of that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hans. Uh, I guess we'll, uh, with self-isolation and shelter in place, we all miss personal connections and uh, uh, me too. So uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, presenting and being here with us. Uh, I, I would like to thank our um, uh, our participants of the live session as well for their questions. I encourage you to reach out, if I may, to reach out to our speakers if you have any additional questions and that would like to clarify. Uh, thank you so much. I enjoyed uh, and I actually, I also have a lot of anxiety about the future of international higher education. This session kind of helped me a lot to, <laughs> to deal with these anxieties. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. And I hope we uh, see each other in person or online uh, and then discuss uh, this issues more. Thank you so much.